As long as Chester will sit here, he can be my co-host. <laughs> Hey team, um, this is a wonderful conversation interview thing uh, that I had with Erica or Gutsick Gibbon, as she is known here on the interwebs. If you are somehow subscribed to me and not her, I don't know how that happened, but her channel is linked in the description. Um, you'll notice Chester, the best co-host, was a little needy throughout this interview and right now and he makes several appearances um so please enjoy his antics and mine and erica's conversation let's chat a little bit about what it is you do so um, so explain to me your field. <laughs> what is what yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. So, um, so my master's degree, um, hopefully to be awarded in the next couple of months. Fingers crossed. You're gonna do great. Uh, it's, a, it's a master's of research, so it's okay. it's an MRes, and those aren't offered very frequently okay. here in the states, but they're quite common in the UK. So it's it's a, a degree that focuses on research methodology, uh, building a project. Um, Kind of learning the ropes on how to design you know a, a, a methodology that you then carry out in the field because primatology is a, a pretty field-based field if you will mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but primatology involves the behavior evolution uh, and general ecology of primates uh, primates being an order that includes a whole lot of animals it's a pretty ancient order it emerged just it's depending but some people say right before the cretaceous um ended with the uh kpg extinction and some saying slightly after um and emerging from small tree dwelling mammals and primates are highly highly specialized they, there's a ton of different criteria that goes into what makes a primate a primate which makes it very difficult to kind of go back in time and say here is definitively the first one um, but a lot of primatology involves going out into the field and observing primates doing primate things. And they can tell us a lot about a lot of different things in ecology, specifically because they are pretty much across the board, with certain exceptions, of course, as always, uh, but a very social order. Um, they're, they're very, very um, keen on getting in groups, small groups, large groups, everything in between. Uh, the range is typically one, which is like your uh, orangutans or certain kinds of night lemurs, all the way up to groups of 800 with Mandrella sphinx, the common mandrel. Um, and so they can tell us a lot about ourselves too, because we are primates. Um, the, the two of us are here having a, a primate conversation um, and using our big brain to body ratio to do it and making sounds with our specialized vocal tract and our dental formula of 2123 and binocular vision and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also is important because primatology, of course, tells us about non-human primates, which are important for conservation and things like that. But fortunately or unfortunately, they also tell us a lot about our own bodies uh, because a lot of primates make great model organisms, which is really sad, but also really important to medicine. Hey team, Editing Maddie here. So model organism was a new term for me. I had not heard that before. Uh, so I went ahead and looked it up after the fact. And what it refers to is any type of non-human animal that is used in a laboratory setting, usually for some type of biological research. So it's it's a very broad field. There, I have a, a advisor specializing in everything from um, looking at sociality, so how groups combine and, and how information is transmitted among members, uh, to feeding ecology, to things like altruism and spite uh, being shared across different individuals. I, I want to say in person, congratulations on getting into your PhD program. That's Thank so exciting. You. I'm I'm very excited. I I also mm -hmm. sent off my thesis first draft last week to my oh. advisor, so I was like, <laughs> it's just a hole in my lap. <laughs> he's going to snuggle. I I sent it off to my uh, to my actual supervisor, and I was like, hey, I was like, here you go. Um, it's ready for you to like read, and then I put in parentheses eviscerate because i was like yeah. i know you're just gonna tear it to pieces and i want that that's good that's a good thing mm -hmm. like my, my fiance keeps having to tell me he's like look it's gonna be a good thing if it gets torn apart because then you can make it better and i'm like 
I don't think that that's how I'm looking at things. <laughs> I'm dreading it. <laughs> so yeah. We'll, we'll see. So I was at the Polar Meteorology Conference and I presented my stuff and like a guy that, uh, you know, another attendee went up to my advisor and was like, I'm going to be the reviewer on that paper. This is going to be my comment. And so it's like, oh, great. So six months later, I like redid all my yeah. master analysis. And, but I think I, I like to use that as an example when I'm talking to like non-science people to be like, no, it's good that that happens. It's That's good. what you want. Yeah, we want, it should be hard to get a paper published. So I, I heard some crack last week from one of the usual suspects. I can't right. remember who it was, but they were like, um, it was something along the lines of like, we can't trust peer review because peer review is anonymous and thus people can't be held to account. And I was like, no, no, no it's the it's opposite. If it's anonymous, mm -hmm. you can be ruthless without yeah. getting backlash for your entire career if you're reviewing like, oh, I don't know, a better, you know? Yeah. Like, it's it's important for it. it is. I, I don't know. The logic is thin and the uh and the white matter is thinner. Yeah, yeah. I currently I have a I don't know if I want to call him a troll, but every time I post a climate video on my channel, he comes on and it's the same block of text that's trying to say that like um climate change can't possibly be real and this is why, right? And and the, the reasoning is very flawed. It, it, um and so the first time I tried to like engage a little bit, um, and it was just like, I've done my own research and and I'm and and journals are Oh, apparently all science journals ever are a conspiracy and you you can't you can't reason with conspiracy theorists. Like right. you, what is what is the um you can't reason someone you can't logic someone out of something they didn't logic themselves into. That's a yeah, that's a very that's, good point. That's, that's I like that. I like I that. I didn't quote. make it up. I, I can't remember I think yeah. I can't remember who said it, but someone someone said it and I was like yeah, that checks out. Um, yeah. That goes for YEC too. It's usually, mm -hmm. it's usually something along those lines. But God, you gotta imagine that kind of person is just like, literally like trolling the waters, looking for climate change videos to slam his block of text yeah. into that no one's reading. Right, right, and that's I don't, I, uh, <laughs> like I don't I know. know what to do no. with it. Have um, you have you read the um Have you read the Death of Expertise? I have not. That sounds I just, really... I finished it the other night, mm -hmm. and it was a very accurate, like, it rung true, and I think it rings mm -hmm. true for anybody who deals with, like, pseudoscience, right? Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. this whole idea that it's, like, the age of information is, like, a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. because it's, like, on one hand, information is easily accessible. On the other hand, it makes everyone think that a Google search is better than a four-year degree, right? It's, like, yeah, like, horrible, like, oh, well, I could be an expert in just like you can as long as I Google enough shit. It's like, no, no, there's definitely an aspect to it that involves learning from people who have wisdom and experience in the field, right? Mm -hmm. Yeesh. Yeah. I think that's that's kind of one of the motivators for my channel is is I want to put, I want to make good information as yep. easily accessible as bad. Yeah. If that. Yeah. <laughs> I... When I talked to Jonathan Baker, he came on my mm -hmm. channel a little while ago, he, he said the same thing. He was like, it really sucks that it's like, people can have access to any number of falsehoods easily by folks who are pumping it out by the hour online. Mm -hmm. um, but excellent papers, excellent academic work is kind of locked behind this gate that not everybody mm -hmm. can access legally. And so it's like, you know what what duty is it of the science communicators if not to take that information and like put it into a digestible form for exactly them? exactly um so how does someone get into primate like no when you ask a seven-year-old what they want to be when they grow up none of them are going to say primate None, and right. unless you find one that loves Jane Goodall, which every now and again Fair. finds okay. some kid that is like, I want to do what, you know, insert kind of famous scientist here. I want to do what she does. Jane Goodall yeah. goes and hangs out with chimpanzees all day, and uh, that's that's really what she did. I mean, she's a total badass. Her and yeah. Diane Fossey and Calticus too. They all did this. This um, they're called Leaky's Angels. Uh, funny, funny enough, um, Richard Leakey, famous, you know, kind of. Uh, pioneer if you will on looking into human fossils fossils of hominids 
Um, and he was like, you know, we don't really know that much about the great apes uh, other than humans. So we need to do that. Let's learn about them. And um, he, he needed to draw funding and attention to the project. And so he thought, okay, I'll send a bunch of young women out there. That'll get everyone's attention because it's like the mid 1900s and women don't typically go into the jungle for, you know, researching animals. <laughs> what? I know, I know. And so uh, so he found the, the Leaky's Angels and he sent uh, Galpicus to, um, to do orangutans and Diane Flossy to gorillas. And um, Jane Goodall went to chimpanzees and Gombe. Bonobos didn't get anybody because they weren't their own species yet. <laughs> Oh, no. tiny chimps pygmy chimpanzees um but yeah getting getting into primatology is is it's not as difficult as you might think you would probably want to start with a biology or a biological anthropology undergraduate okay. um make sure you're really interested in uh in both the biology aspect and kind of the the anatomy aspect because with mm-hmm. primatology there's a lot of it that goes into gross morphology, especially if you're looking into um, to the evolution of certain traits, differences between species, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there tends to be a, a deficit of like primatology majors. That's not something that you really specialize in okay. so, at the level of undergrad, I guess you would say. Yeah. Kind of like you, you can't major in entomology typically. Um, right, okay. You tend, to be able, you tend to major in biology and then specialize in ento when you get into like your master's degree. Okay. Um, so it's a similar thing with primatology. It's just a, an, a group, a, a subset of biology that you can get into and you can come from the ant side or you can come from the biology side. Uh, and there's a ton of master's programs out there that focus on primatology, especially in Europe and the UK, because they are better than us at anthropology and primatology in general, by and large, not across. We have some great schools here, but mm-hmm. they've got, they just have more programs because, I mean, you know, that's... They're, they're closer to most of the hot spots in the first place, but they've also got the Max Institute and mm-hmm. Well, and like I'm that. even thinking about, like, I did my undergrad at MIT, right? right? And MIT does not offer a human anatomy course, right? Mm-hmm. Let alone, so all the pre-meds at MIT have to go take anatomy at Harvard. Yeah, um, I believe that. Because biology at MIT is very focused on, like, microbiology and biological engineering. That makes um, sense. Yeah. It's not super difficult. It's just a specialization, I guess. I mean, that that's, yeah. I'm getting my PhD in um, biological anthropology, but I'm, I'm going to specialize in primatology. It's, it's primatology focused. Right. Well, hope, yeah. Hope, yeah. The hope is getting my PhD, making my PhD project on extant primates, which is what I'm the most interested in. Okay. Um, even though human evolution is dope and, you know, I'll find, you know, want to connect, connect it there somewhere, obviously, but it's, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's a great field. I mean, it's I love it, but I'm biased, you know. <laughs> so, were were you the kid that just loved Jane Goodall? Like, were you Jane Goodall for Halloween every single year? So, actually, actually, no. Which is no. kind of the so it's kind of the interesting thing about it is that I found my way into primatology by essentially being thrust aggressively into it Um, (laughs) excellent yeah which is just great it's really awesome um the the situation was kind of like when i was in undergrad i was pre-professional animal science that's what my undergraduate degree is so it's pre-vet my my degree is pre-vet it's a lot of biochem it's a lot of chem it's a lot of things that i hated um Mm. as i was moving through it and my freshman year, um, I, I, w- I knew I wanted to study abroad because I knew that I just wanted to see more of the world and I was young and am young, I guess, but I was like, I wanna seize this moment. So that's what I'll do, I will study abroad. And that summer, uh, there was a program being offered at our study abroad fair, um, the study abroad fair being in the fall, but for a program in the summer, uh, called Ecology and Evolution in Tanzania. And I was like, that's right up my alley. I was like, I, I love, I would love to go to Tanzania. Going to Tanzania would be amazing. Think of all the animals I would see. It'd be awesome. I'm going. Mm-hmm. Um, and the anthropology thing was like something, like I cared about human evolution, but it was kind of more like, oh, it's, it's cool. Uh, primates are cool, but animals in general are all cool. So whatever. Um, so I went on this trip. I had to apply and do all the, the dat- jazz for it. And this was when Ebola was breaking out in the west of Africa. So the Ooh. trip was smaller than normal. And tourism was 
dirt cheap because it was like so we got to do a lot of the stuff that the normal programs wouldn't get to do because no one was going to have despite the fact by the way that the difference between east africa and west africa is like it's a like the difference continent. between Miami and Anchorage. Yeah, yeah. it's like the insane distance but like there was no risk where we were going right. to Angola. But hmm. that's a really that's a very American I don't know if it's a purely American thing, but it's a very Western thing to we think Africa is much smaller than it is. <laughs> yeah, Tanzania is like the size of Texas. And the Mercator projections don't help. It's like mm -hmm. this it's a huge country and it's one of dozens. I mean it, Africa is immense and it's amazing and I I would love to go back at some point. I'm hoping to find an excuse to do my PhD work over there. That um, would be amazing. Yeah, it would be amazing. But uh, a part of the trip involved going to Olivai Gorge. Olivai Gorge is a very, very famous um, fossil find site for human evolution. Uh, some habilis being found there, um, some australopithecines, things like that. It's also where the Laetoli footprints are found nearby, which are very famous trackway footprints. Um, of a trio of um, a trio of australopithecines walking in the ash. Uh, it's a young female, uh, her, her mate, a male, large male, uh, and, a, and a youngster who's walking in the footsteps of the big male. You can see his footsteps in the, his or her footsteps in, the, in his, his presumably father's footprints. And But the, the big thing, the big thing that changed my mind that, that I was like, okay, I might want to be like an anthropologist or like do mm -hmm. do this primatology thing uh originally i was just like i didn't even know primatology was something that you could specialize in i was like oh, oh i must be an anthropologist chester hi oh his ears they're they are soft like velvet i, I uh, little uh australian cattle dogs are so or healers red red healers are like that their, their ears are so velvet is the perfect way of putting it honestly yeah, but the, the, the biggie for me was we got the opportunity to go to uh, Gombe Stream National Park, um, which is right next to Lake Tanganyika in Central Africa. It is where Jane Goodall first did her work with the chimpanzees. So cool. And yeah, we got to stay, you know, a week there. And it was probably one of the coolest experiences of my life. We we got to, we, we washed our clothes in the river, or the, mm -hmm. in, it's a very long lake, so I always want to call it a river, but it's a lake. Washed our clothes in the lake, you could see the Congo across the river, you know, and there were baboons constantly stealing our stuff. It was, that part was funny when it wasn't me, and then it was me, and it wasn't funny anymore. <laughs> um, but during the day, we would go and track the chimpanzees. We would go into the forest and follow the chimpanzees around, the members of the G group. And um, it was, it was just a life-changing deal. We, we followed this group of females, a young group of females around, uh, and one of them had an infant. We're following them around, you know, and I've got this, I've told this story on a couple of streams before just because it's a really big deal for me. Cause I, yeah. I, saw, I saw this female and you know, she's got her, her youngster kind of tucked up next to her and she's foraging. And I thought to myself, I was like, I'm gonna, I can get a closer look. So I, I shimmied away from the group and, and started getting closer and closer. And I was probably about five feet away from her um huddled up next to this tree she looks up at me and we make eye contact and i was struck i was i was absolutely floored by this this expression you know like it was like looking at a human there mm. you know I, I know it's kind of like anthropomorphizing or whatever or there's a risk there but you know you could see the gears turning you know, and when we made eye contact, she, you know, they, they lowly hoot as kind of a warning. And that's what she did to me. It was basically like, hey, you need to back off or I'm going to tear you apart. <laughs> like, like, I've got this kid here and I'm really not interested in seeing you here. But there was also like this weird, re it was almost like a regarding, like it was like, hey, what are you doing here? Like, you're not a chimp. You here you are in the forest. Like, why are you here? Um, and I was just like starstruck and I backed up really quickly and I was like holy cow and I told my uh professor who was leading the trip and he's like that's a really cool experience he's like they uh they surprise you with that you know they they look at you and they're like dude what are you doing like, why are you following me around and, and eventually they stopped caring but I was like man what an experience like getting to get that close to a wild chimpanzee and an infant and I was like this is what if I could do this forever, like as a living? Like, what if I could do that, you know, follow these guys around and watch them? And it was so cool to watch them build nests and use tools and do all sorts of stuff that chips do that, oh, you know, cool. humans do too. Like, I mean, we, we care about the same things.
And of course, the, the area that I'm looking at is is uh, dental morphology, which is the most exciting of all of the fields. <laughs> Um, and the human evolution tends to, there's a, a big overlap between biological anthropology and, um, and biology meeting in the middle to form primatology. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the deal. My original research project was I was going to actually research uh, sex differences in the expression of spite in uh, pig-tailed macaques, Macaca nimistrina over in peninsular Malaysia. Uh, but you know, I don't know if I don't know if you've heard, but there's a little thing that's making travel a little difficult right now. So I could not go and do that project, and I had to redo my entire deal, figure out what I was going to study, find a data set, and do something new. So I decided to focus on um, what pressures are at play in emerging monomorphism in primates because primates have a really wide range of social di or of sexual differences. Um, some are totally monomorphic, meaning there's no difference between the sexes. Gibbons, for example, my favorite primate, um, they, you can't tell the males and females apart other unless they have a pelage difference, like a different coat color. They both got these huge honking dagger canine teeth in their mouth that they <laughs> use to fight each other if, um, if other external members come into their territory. They tend to form monogamous pairs, but sometimes they're polygynous. Um, and the same goes for like teeny monkeys, calitricans, uh, to a lesser degree, members of genus pan. And then you've got mandrels um, and baboons and macaques where males are just enormous and they've got these gigantic canine teeth, you know, that tall uh, in their mouths and females have little dinky ones. Uh, so my question was like, okay, because the ancestor of, of most of the of the haplorine um, primates, or I guess I should say catarine primates, it, it could be either, both really, uh, was sexually dimorphic, mm -hmm. why do we have monomorphic ones today? Um, so what pressures lead to a difference in, or lead to uh, the reduction in the sex differences of primates? This is especially important because humans aren't very sexually dimorphic. Um, you and your husband have the same size canine teeth. So why is that? What happened? Um, and so that's that was kind of my interest is that it's like I, I want to take a look at extant primates and see how that applies to human evolution. Um, so that's the monologue <laughs> on primates. Oh, that's, that's spectacular. And you have um, so much sympathy from me for having mm. to pivot on your whole master's thesis. Uh, I can't imagine how stressful that must have been, especially it wasn't while you were moving across, uh, not even across country, you were moving across an ocean. <laughs> it wasn't great. It wasn't great. And God bless my field site manager. She was like, look, when you can come over here, like maybe next summer, you know, come on over and do three months. Cause that was the original stint. It was, it's a master's mm -hmm. research. So it's not very long. Right. Um, and so she was like, just come over and you can do it like it's it's fine you'll we'll pay you'll be an official research assistant then instead of just an intern you know so it's like come on over when you can and then malaysia decided to shut down the borders for the whole summer too so maybe next summer maybe next summer <laughs> i i heard yeah. something once that was like <clears throat> if you're writing a phd on a subject or you're writing a master's thesis on a subject odds are that at that given point in time you're like one of the top 10 people in the world who knows about that subject. Yep. But it's so narrow. It's so and narrow. I, and I was feeling that because I was like, I was like, okay, I think I might be uh, currently one of the leading experts on primate canine teeth, at least at a macro scale. Yeah. These particular species. And I was like, don't That's mind really... if I do, just call me doctor. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good feeling when you hit that you're feeling in your graduate program, when you realize that um, you are the expert in the room on your thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you've got to like earn that spot. You know, it takes it takes a few years. Um, but when I when I started doing my seminars and I realized that like, oh, I'm talking about Arctic meteorology. My advisor isn't in the room because he has another meeting right now. Mm -hmm. No one else here does Arctic meteorology. These are severe weather in the mid latitudes and other things. So like, oh, okay, I know what I, I it was it was uncomfortable because it's like. You're like bow to me. I yeah, am the like, a little bit, but it's also like, oh no, clearly I need an adult. Oh no, I am the yeah. adult. Okay, oh, okay. But then like once you kind of get past that, it feels really good. Um, and I'm, I'm very, you know, 
what I'm learning about getting a PhD is that that is the it's the marathon. It's not the sprint. If you don't if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to finish because this is not about how smart you are. This is yeah. about can you just keep putting one foot in front of the other? Putting putting a good dissertation together, right? It's yeah. like yeah, I've I've had pretty much everyone I've talked to who is currently in a PhD program or got one is like, mm. oh, it's going to be great but you also might hate it sometimes. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, good. Yeah. Good, it's, good, good. Awesome. I, I just refer to myself as a discount scientist these days. Yeah. Um, I I think yeah. it counts. I My advisors um, said, they were like, look, the second that you do, like the second that you're like doing a stats analysis with data either you collected or gathered, you kind of just, you kind of just get to be a scientist at that point. Like mm-hmm. you can just call yourself, you don't have to be an expert, but like technically you can just you can be a scientist, you know, it's whatever, it's fine. And I'm like, I don't feel comfortable with that label. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and that, I think part of the PhD is like the transition from like, you're realizing, oh, okay, I am the expert in, in this, you know, um, yep. it's very <clears> much, you do you do learn a lot and you can become very aware of what you know and you also become very aware of what you don't know which i think is oh, really yeah helpful. that's that's the beautiful one aware of what you don't know story of my mm. life yeah no i i feel i feel like i know less now than i felt like i knew when i started graduate school that's the that's the sign they say yeah that's apparently that's a good thing yeah, they um, say that that's the moment when you know for sure. It's like, oh, you're a real scientist when you start thinking that you know less than you do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my husband has handed me a note to ask you. Ask if... What? Okay, ask if Billy Apes and Kula Kambas are real. That's what I'm Ellen- supposed to ask. I don't know what a Kula Kamba is, but I do know about Billy Apes, and uh, Billy Apes, sometimes called Bondo Apes, yeah, they are a real, they are a real animal. Um, probably, for a while it was, okay, so this is a cryptid, right? And for okay. a long time people were like, okay, what's going on in like the Congo, where we've got this group of high, supposedly highly aggressive lion killer chimps, is Ooh, kind of what they were okay. known way bigger than normal chimps they would take casts of their feet and they've got these large footprints and everyone was like what's going on there so for a while it was kind of like oh it's a cryptid they, these guys are aren't real and then some people were like well actually maybe it's a co- oh it's a cross between gorillas and chimpanzees uh because some of the the skulls would show up with these sagittal crests which are known for male gorillas but not okay. super common or evident in chimps Sagittal crest was also a new term for me, so I, I looked at some pictures, and um, here's a good one. So it's that uh, cool ridge-looking feature there on this gorilla skull. That is a sagittal crest. Okay, back to Erica. Well, it turned out that it's just like they sent folks out there, and there really is a population of very robust chimpanzees there. And they sequence, they've sequenced their genome, their chimp. Yeah. Okay. But they're probably their own subspecies. That's there's okay. argument going on about what subspecies it is. If it's going to be like Troglodytes, Troglodytes, Troglodytes virus, or, or maybe something totally new, because they really are very strange looking uh, for, for oh, chimps. I mean, they're, cool. but but that's what they are. I mean, it's 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 definitely like a tale of, and they're big. That's another weird okay. thing. They are very big, um, not lion killer size and they certainly aren't encountering <laughs> lions all the time but um, right or ever but but they're they're big chimps uh and it's kind of i don't know it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because it's like okay um and the same thing happened with like the uh the okapi the um you know the do you know the okapi they're like um it was we thought it was a mythical creature and then they found one yeah exactly okay. yeah they're um they're those they look kind of like a giraffe crossed with a zebra crossed with an antelope um, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, but they're totally real. Or platypus. That was another one. The first taxidermy platypus was labeled a hoax because they were like, "There's no way an animal looks like this." <laughs> um, but sometimes they just do. Like, right. Uh, and I kind of love that. So, like, yeah, nobody would come up with a platypus, right? Nobody writing fiction would come up with a platypus, right? No, Our, the, never would. 
right? The best we've got is like a jackalope. It's like it's a rabbit, but with yeah. antlers. Yeah. And it's just like, but the platypus is that. Like it's a total, yeah. like it feels like a mythic hybrid, like a kind yeah. of, you know, where it's like, okay, let's see. Uh, body tail of a beaver, legs of a duck, bill of a duck, uh, covered in fur, you know, uh, poisonous spurs on the back feet, like or venomous spurs on the back feet. It's like, what's going on here? Who made this thing? You know? Yeah. Like, Australia is just bonkers. If you you didn't you don't even need the Galapagos for like proof of evolution. You just need Australia, right? Oh, yeah. It's like this is what happens when you're trapped on an island. <laughs> that uh, island islands do weird things to creatures, man. Like islands are a whole. And uh, the weird thing is, so it's not just islands. It's anything that can mimic the effect of an island too. So it's like okay. you can have um they call it insular dwarfism. So rather than like island dwarfism, but it's like if you can get out of artificial islands like in um populations okay you can get dwarfism effects too they think that's what happened with marmosets and tamarins and that's why they're itty bitty cuties instead of uh hulking adelins like spider monkeys so yeah what kind of tools do chimps like when you say tool use like what does that look like yeah um i mean the stuff that we saw was like pretty simple stripping okay. um stripping long uh lead or like stems kind of like scythed stems and stuff like that for termite fishing where they lick okay. those things termite fish um but tool use in, in chimpanzees is very extensive and it's different based on the population you're looking at so females across the board use tools more often than males do uh because they sometimes go off and hunt by themselves and they will sharpen um sticks with their teeth and use them to spear small mammals um like bush babies and things like that um, oh, wow. So it's, I mean, it's really interesting, but like officially, I mean, based on how we do it with humans, like technically they're in their stone age. They select rocks, they carry around their favorite rocks, they pass rocks on, they teach youngsters how to use rocks to crack open things like nuts and um, and other like hard food stuffs. Yeah. And they know, they select them with purpose. They, it's not any, not any rock will do. It has to be something that is basically akin to a hand axe, which is just insane you know how they you know use it and if one day they share tools sometimes um but yeah they, they they've got some interesting stuff going on there's there's a culture there that's very primitive of course primitive in the sense that we assess it which is right kind of silly and dumb honestly like it's their own culture who's to say it's primitive yeah um but so yeah they're there's, they do a lot of really interesting stuff with those tools. Do you see, are there differences in populations of chimpanzees and how they do tool use because it, because these are taught skills? Yep. In fact, and a very interesting deal is that if you put a chimpanzee from one organ, like from one group who has learned that tool, that way of using a tool into a different group, mm -hmm. uh, they will frantically adopt the local custom. So, uh, or I, if memory serves on occasion, it depends on the rank. It's usually someone who's coming okay. in at a very low rank. Um, but there are instances too of cross group transmission of culture, so teaching others how to do okay. certain things. Um, there, there's crazy. It's really, it's really cool. There, there was an instance, quite a funny one of a group of chimpanzees where one female, for whatever reason, started putting a piece of grass behind her ear okay like she just liked it i guess like it's it's kind of silly to think about but we do stuff all the time that's arbitrary and we do it because we think it's fun we like it uh so she put this piece of grass up there i think her name was judy i think that was her the name that was given to her um but other chimps started doing it like they started seeing this thing in her ear and they were like i like that and started yeah. taking grass and putting it in her ear and putting it in their ears and it's like this fashion it. that's yeah that, that that sounds like fashion that sounds yeah like super primitive jewelry almost yeah. um or yeah. like how we would put we, could, we put flowers in our hair and why why is a flower better than grass you like it yeah, yeah. it's just you like it um they're and, pr it's pretty and smells nice like yeah and it's fun it's just like oh what if i oh i look different wow that's, that's really enjoyable and yeah you know, they're, they do that kind of stuff all the time. Chimps and bonobos, man, are just, and orangs, really. Gorillas, too, to a lesser extent, I think. But um, yeah, they, they do all sorts of weird, innovative stuff. And 
sometimes yeah. they pass it on and sometimes they don't i mean it's it's just like human culture I, yeah just like which is why we call it a culture like yeah. oh that's um, so cool. i had a thought and that's um i think if you were to live in say tanzania and have interactions with wild primates right that that was an option i think it must be a lot harder to be a young earth creationist in that setting oh boy you know i mean and i tell i say this i say mm-hmm. this all the time but mm-hmm. um first of all the, the father of taxonomy uh carl Linnaeus, mm-hmm. he very famously when assessing um the, the skeletons of primates that he had uh, in, in a local museum collection. He's sitting there and he's like, and I'm paraphrasing the quote, but he's, he yeah. says essentially like, I can think of no reason um, by which to separate man from simian or simian from man, uh, yet should I not find one, I should bring the whole of theologians down upon my head. And then he's like, maybe I should by virtue of the discipline, uh, which is basically, he's just like, or monkey like what are you gonna do like yeah just, that's how it is and we share all of the same and this was way before genetics obviously this mm-hmm. is like the father of taxonomy and he's like well i mean and so his solution to the problem was to first he he, he grappled going back and forth he thought okay well maybe maybe you got the pongids and then maybe humans are something different um we're still primates but once you get down to the apes maybe we're a special kind of civilized beast you know or something unique um, and then he was also like, okay, but we could also elevate the apes to our status. So he mm. he toyed with the idea of putting uh, orangutans in genus Homo, which is hilarious um, and really, really neat. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and it's no coincidence that all cultures, all, I can't generalize, a lot of cultures that mm. have primates in their uh, vicinity have one myth or another of either humans coming from primates by doing some kind of mistake of the gods or vice versa. Primates being the result, other primates being the result of humans being cursed for doing something wrong. Oh, okay. Um, because it's like, they look so much like us. They're just like little people. What's the yeah. deal? Why are they like this? <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it's that's awesome. Neat. Really, really neat stuff. That's really cool. So that, that's kind of like, I think it's, uh, you know, living, born and raised in, in the middle of Toronto Alley, you know, I think about like, I have a very different relationship with the weather than people yeah. in Europe, for example, because yeah. like, Europe, uh, especially England, that climate is notoriously <laughs> boring. Yeah. <laughs> um, as heck. Yeah. It doesn't try to kill you ever. Lame. Um, and so to me, I think, I think a lot of times, but I think the world must feel much more wild to me that it, and dangerous like just because of like oh is it gonna are we gonna get softball sized hail today or you know like mm-hmm. it's, it's thundering outside and I'm getting excited because to me that means spring right yeah. but with that brings a sense of imper- uh, impermanence you mm-hmm. know like everything I have could be gone tomorrow because if a tornado hits my house it's right. gone and there's nothing I can do about that um and so I think I, I, so that was made me think, and then I was thinking like, you know, I've only ever seen a, a chimpanzee or a gorilla. I've only ever seen them in a zoo. And in that setting, you would never have that experience that you described, right? You would never have an experience where you, they feel so related. And so, yeah. um, I don't even want to say human because they, they are their own species, right? right? But their own species with their own culture. Um, but you're right. I mean, there's yeah. there's there's a sense there of like, this is their turf, and I'm where I shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, and and there's there's this weird recognition of that on both parties. Mm-hmm. Like where it's like they're like you shouldn't be here, and I'm like I shouldn't be here. <laughs> you know. But I bet it, it is very similar to to growing up in Tornado Alley and 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 just having that intimacy with weather because it's like this. It's a unique yeah. experience that isn't mm-hmm. shared by everyone. Um, yeah. And it just, it gives you a totally different fl- a, a different taste for it. I'm very against the primate pet trade. I want that public. I haven't done a video on the primate pet mm. trade, but don't have primates. They're they don't like being with pets. Did Did you watch Tiger King like everyone else on planet Earth? Yeah. Oh did yeah. You- so one, yeah, that made me like, oh my gosh, why do people do this? These are yeah. wild animals. This is not what they are for. Two, she made 
they made some crack on Tiger P2 where he was like, Tiger people are crazy, but like primate people are crazier. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Like who yeah. would own a primate? Like you, you owning a chimpanzee is like owning a, like a, a toddler that can folk out. Yeah. Like, like they just never grow up. They're a toddler that is three times stronger than you and can tear your face off if they get upset. Like you don't want to own one of those. They belong nope. doing their own thing. I'm very, yeah. st- love chimps. I would never like, yeah keep one in my house <laughs> yeah um so the crazy thing about tiger king is there was a real sketchy zoo close to where i grew up really? um, owned by a guy named joe in rural oklahoma and there were definitely lions and other big cats and we watched the whole series for me to realize this was a different a different sketchy zoo in rural Oklahoma owned by a guy named Joe. <laughs> so, like, it's got to be, like, a pre-rep, right? Like, it's you gotta have be. to be, like, a, a scary middle-aged man named Joe in order to own big cats and have a profit off of them. That makes sense to me. I... <laughs> I'm bummed that I didn't get to do this in front of my in front of my skulls. We've got uh, company right now, so you know, the guest room is, is taken up. But normally, you know, gotcha. the opportunity, any yeah. opportunity to reach back and manhandle a skull on camera is like the that sole reason like that they're there. <laughs> I do all of my Zoom streams in here. This is just my living room because it's next to the internet router. Um, but I, you've got the three libraries in the back. I do, which I know makes me look like a snob or something, but these are all fiction. Like, <laughs> like uh, oh gosh, I can tell from here. Like that, that's my Patrick O'Brien collection that I oh love. Oh my God. Um, that is the Three Musketeers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm glad to know that because when I first saw I was like, damn that's really impressive i was like that's oh no my weather books <laughs> these are not what this isn't all my weather books are at my office at school that checks um, out that checks out yeah this is these are all uh these are just all this is leisure. all fiction <laughs> this Le- is leisure yeah absolutely this is this is proof that um as a teenager i didn't have a social life <laughs> oh god oh my god i all my all my books from growing up are still at my parents house so it's just like Ooh. boxes in the basement full of like really yeah looking back cringe really like the we, i don't know if i told you that i made this for last time warrior cats I got a lot of the oh we did talk about warrior cats basement. yeah excellent <laughs> got a lot of warrior cats of my basement oh don't worry we just so um my parents and my husband's uh uh father sold our childhood homes like in the same year right after we like bought our first house yeah and so all your um, stuff is there all of our childhood stuff appeared so we finally like opened the last box from my husband's house and it was just like we now we have on a bookshelf this many animorphs books (laughs) oh my god there's so many the the thing is the thing is i know i know that you're not lying because i read animorphs too and i couldn't keep up with how many books there were (laughs) oh and we also found did you read these are all the like scholastic book fair exclusive books oh but yeah the, mm. the dear america books did you read those i think i have a handful of them okay because I, I just I found all of mine which is yeah. i'm realizing how i learned more about american history <laughs> yeah oh yeah i i have a couple of um of <laughs> long-term borrows from the library of like the most extreme where it's like you open it up and it's like the most extreme like venom and it's like all these different kinds of snakes and like how they you know and they've got these really overdone illustrations they're really really 1990s and they're really fun like the extreme you know oh my gosh hardcore like the book that I had from the scholastic book fair that I wore out as a kid like it it fell it, it broke in half was um it was kind of it was illustrated so it was kind of like a comic but it was just like a paperback but it was all about greek history oh and that's culture. so cool yeah um, <laughs> and i just i just read it over and over, and over, and over. did you ever read the uh the, the percy jackson books those were I, very i did very i fun. am actually i've read them as an adult because i was curious they're um, fun right they're, they're very fun, books, fun. right yeah. i do I was, Percy Jackson books I'm just too old for 
I know. I, right? I, uh, it's Harry Potter. I was like, I was his age as the books were coming yeah, out. So yeah, it was yeah. like perfect. Yeah, growing growing up when the Harry Potter books were still coming out, because Deathly Hollows came out when I was still pretty young, but I, yeah. I still remember everything surrounding it where it was like, there's yeah. I've never seen so, before or since, so much hype around a book, except maybe if The Winds of Winter ever gets released. Right. Maybe that would be similar. Yeah, but no, I, I absolutely was at, from the fourth book forward, I was at every midnight release. Um, my, my, God bless my mother, right, who would, like, drive me, um, the third kid sits a tough one. Yeah, well, and that's even to this day, right, it's her and my advisor are the two people on the planet that have read my thesis. Oh, um. I, uh, I, I sympathize so hard, because my yeah. mom will go, she'll be like, how's, how's the thesis going? No details, Right. how's the thesis going? I've got a dog barking at hearing someone walking down the street okay. she's upset. so if she barks I'll, i might mute for a minute because she's okay. getting upset but um yeah she's like so we need to let low on the details but like thesis going well i'm like yeah yeah it's going really well and i'm just like don't say anything don't get into it it's too much it's too much and I'm, <laughs> i just can't seem to find information on allopithecus uh nigerceps it's very difficult to find anything but yeah. he's like that's a monkey, right? That's, that's yeah. That's pretty much what I would be, right? Is it? Because I don't know. I don't know anything about monkeys. It's not my field. Thank you guys so much for checking out this video. Um, I learned so much about primatology and just a whole other field of science that I have no expertise in, um, and I really enjoyed it. So. That's all I've got for you guys. Um, if you have not subscribed, please, uh, you know, like, subscribe, all that, all that fun YouTuber stuff, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye, team.